everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a furry friend of ours because we are covering the oh so wonderful African lion. This, of course, is a very special listener episode dedicated to Ali, Veronica, Matt, Saren, Dorina, and Nick. Thank you all for the amazing request. This episode would not have been possible without you. Just a couple of things before we actually hop into the episode. You may have noticed that last week there was no episode and that now on a Saturday or a Sunday the episode is live. This was not at all intentional. For those of you that don't know, I work in healthcare, and so around this time of year, things tend to get a little bit wild, more wild than the lion we're learning about today, maybe. And so thank you for your understanding and for your patience. I never like to upload things late, but sometimes I'm squeezed into some corners. The second thing that I'd like to mention is that this is actually the end of season 5. This is the 25th episode marking the finish of the 5th season. And because it is the end of the season, the show will be taking a 2 week break. And so do not expect new episodes for the next 2 weeks, but we will be back on the 3rd week. Now, during this time, please still send messages to the podcast, request your animals and everything else. For those of you who are not on the Instagram, make sure to go and follow the Instagram because during the break, I'm going to be doing a live session in which all of you can give me feedback and advice and ways that you think the show could be better. This show is made by you and for you in terms of your animal requests and your listenership. And so I want to make the podcast as best as I can. And that means taking in all of your feedback. And now let's move on. If you would like to know how to request an animal and where all the facts came from to make this episode, it will be at the end of the episode and it will also be immediately available in the description or the podcast show notes. Now I would like for all of you to notice perhaps where you are carrying some tension. We are in a festive season, but with that festive season sometimes comes a lot of Christmas shopping and long lines and traffic and all the rest. And so I have two primary exhortations for each of you. The first is that your shoes are on tight and tied nicely. We are going to need that for where we are going today. And the second thing I ask of you is that you do your best to imbibe jello. By that I mean that any of the tension that we are carrying, whether it's in the shoulders, in the legs, wherever it is, we do not need it where we are going. And so I encourage you to imagine jello and try your best to simply impersonate it. Lastly, simply allow your mind to wander and journey with me into the savannas where the African lion resides. As we are walking through this African savanna, you can just notice the dry wind that is brushing up against our cheeks and take in the magnificent colors that are all around us. For some of us, beige and this tawny brownish color is something that we skip over, but there is something special and peculiar to each habitat. Yes, we may not have the lush greenery of the rainforest, but we also do not have the craggy mountain tops that sport an entirely different but still breathtaking scenery. And here among the tawny grass and the beige floor, we can see a creature that resembles the similar colors that we are seeing here. That of course is the African lion. 
I'm not sure if you are as surprised as I am that we are covering the African Lion on our fifth season after over 120 episodes. Better late than never. These are of course animals that are iconic in the sense that throughout history they have been used as symbols of courage, of strength, and there is certainly a reason for this. Its large paws, its posture, their mane, and their confident countenance or just their facial expression is one that can give us an impression that this animal knows it's a king. And of course that is why many kings use the lion as their symbol. Now in the cat family, they are second in size only to tigers. Tigers are actually slightly larger than lions. While they are similar in size, the adult lion's coat is going to be quite a different color than that of the striped tiger. The lion is going to have that yellow gold color all the way through with those characteristic brown manes. While the juveniles or the younger lions are going to have some light spots scattered around that will slowly dissipate as they grow up. That word mane that I am using is used to describe a fringe of hair that encircles their head. I could probably count the amount of creatures that have a mane, at least the ones that I am aware of, on my hand. And so there is something about creatures with manes that seem to stir in us a greater admiration or curiosity. Now, why exactly are we walking the savannas in sub-Saharan Africa instead of somewhere else? Well, if we were beginning our journey 2,000 years ago, we might be somewhere else. That is because many parts of Asia and Europe as well as other parts of Africa used to have large swaths of lions. But in our current day, lions have all but disappeared from 94% of the range that they used to have in history. For those of you that love history, we can read in many different historical works, say those of the ancient Roman authors, in which lions would be brought to Rome from the surrounding areas for games and these different things that they had at the time. Now, how is it that the ancient Romans were able to get lions all the way to Rome? And the answer is that they didn't have to go all that far. Lions roamed around much of northern Africa and Europe some time ago. In fact, many historians exclusively point their fingers towards the Roman emperors as being solely responsible for the extinction of many species that used to live in that area. The lion is, of course, one of them. And so today we are roaming sub-Saharan Africa, which comprises about 6% of its total historic range. African lions will mainly stick to scrub or open woodlands as well as grasslands. This is because it allows them to more easily hunt their prey. But lions in general will live in most habitats aside from tropical rainforests and really truly arid climates like deserts. While we are covering the African lion, there is a lion species known as Asiatic lions, which are regarded actually as subspecies of the African lion, but there is only one very small population that continues to live today in India's Gur forest. Now, the scientific name of the African lion is the Panthera leo. Panthera is a Latin word that comes from a Greek word that is used to describe panthers or leopards. But that word panthera can be broken down into pan and thera, which means all beast. And as we are looking at this creature, we can see how large and intimidating they are. They can be between four and a half to six and a half feet tall while sporting a 26 to 40 inch tail. They will weigh somewhere between 265 to 420 pounds, and the reason why there was such a large difference in the weight is of course accounting for males and females. 
which in African lions can be quite different. Now, just in case we are not sure, I don't wish to assume anything, but when we say that the African lion lives in sub-Saharan Africa, I just wish to clarify what exactly that means. That adjective that I'm using, sub-Saharan, means that the area we are talking about are regions in Africa that are south of the Sahara Desert. Sub usually means below or under, and sub-Saharan Africa covers a lot of space. When we see a few different lions together, and they form a group, what lion groups are called are prides. So like we might say certain birds are a flock, or certain aquatic groups are pods. In the case of the African lion, they are prides. Prides are very closely knit family groups. These family groups will work together in order to not only hunt prey, but also to defend their range or their territory. You may have noticed that in many documentaries, the lions that are hunting the prey don't have these large manes. That is because those are female lions. The females in the pride tend to do the majority of the hunting for the group, and they will oftentimes work together using hunting tactics in order to corner and catch prey which they would obviously have a much more difficult time catching if they were simply on their own. Lions as a whole, but it seems especially the male lions, enjoy relaxing and lazing around. Sort of like many of our domestic house cats. They will spend somewhere between 16 and 20 hours each day sleeping and relaxing. There is a reason that they do this biologically, and so not all of the blame can be put on strict laziness here. They actually don't have too many sweat glands, and so this is a way of conserving energy by resting, and this conserved energy will then be used to hunt more effectively at night. The reason sweat glands are so important is because it is a mechanism by which we can regulate heat or body temperature. So we can imagine that in the blazing temperatures of sub-Saharan Africa, few sweat glands would make it really challenging to be super active the entire day. Now these manes that the males grow, but not the females, will grow up to 16 centimeters long and are a sign of dominance. Over time, their manes will change color, growing darker and darker, creating a persona of grit and toughness. So this means that we would most likely be able to tell the difference between a young lion who has a fully grown mane and an older lion who also has a fully grown mane. The color is the indicator as to their age, at least from afar. Now, in the specific prides of lions, while the females are going to be doing a lot of the hunting, the male, or sometimes small groups of males, will defend their pride. The lionesses will, of course, be feeding the young until they are of age to go and hunt themselves. Now, a reason the lion will be hunting at night is because they have specialized eyes that are very keen in the dark. This will provide the lion with an exceptional advantage, especially over prey that do not have any such mechanism, or at least not to the extent that the lion has. And unlike many cats that I have come in contact with, these huge wild cats will hunt more during storms, because storms provide lions something like an auditory camouflage. The wind and the noise and the rustling will make it much harder for prey to distinguish the steps and moves of the lion over just any regular natural ambiance. With decreased visibility and auditory cues, this will make hunting prey a much easier business for the lion. And during these hunts, which will sometimes be during a storm, the lionesses, which we remember do the majority of the hunting, they will take specific roles in their hunting pack. Some will play the role of center, while the lionesses that take the wings, the left or the right, will be correcting the prey 
not allowing the prey to run out to the left or to the right and keeping them in a straight line. This is a great tactic for creatures that will often evade predators not simply by how fast they run or how long they can run for, but by doing these impressively quick zigzag movements that will wear out any large predator. So we can see how hunting in groups, and specifically in these groups with intelligent hunting tactics, can allow the lionesses to take down some pretty big animals. Some of the creatures that these lionesses will be going for are going to be antelopes, wildebeest, zebras, and other large animals. Zebras and antelopes are both pretty big, wildebeests even more so. So that is how fierce a predator the lion can be. Now after the impeccable teamwork and coordination of the lionesses in their hunting, the whole group will often get into some maybe family squabbles over who gets what portion of the kill. A kind of pecking order will form with the cubs of course at the bottom, as young lions do not have the opportunity or they do not help to hunt until they are about a year old. So they will have to wait while the adult males and the lionesses get their share first. Sometimes it is not necessary for the lion to have to go out and do these coordinated tactics and they will instead employ a kind of scavenging approach in which they will steal the kills of other creatures like hyenas or wild dogs. Now when they are eating, apart from of course their incredibly sharp teeth, the tongue of a lion is exceedingly rough. That is because on their tongue they are covered with these sharp spines that are called papillae or papillae. They will cover the tongue of the lion and it will be used to scrape meat off of the bones. That function for us as human beings is mostly relegated to using our teeth, but they have such rough tongues that they can simply lick the meat off the bones, literally. Lions are the only known cat species where the individuals of the group will roar together. Oftentimes in the cat world it is something of an individual behavior, but not for the lion. Sometimes even the young cubs will join in with their little mews. The roaring sequence will last usually for about 40 seconds, and a pride of lions will often do this kind of roaring to mark their territory, creating something like an auditory marker, and this roar can be heard up to five miles away. Now for those of you who have cats at home, you might be surprised to learn that the paws of your house cat will be very similar to that of a lion's paws, of course, with the exception of size. Their paws are the same, except lions will have paws that are much, much bigger. On the back, they will have four toes, while on the front, they will have five toes. And just like your pet cat, lions have those similar retractable claws that they can choose to engage whenever they see fit. It is pretty amazing that you can get a little bit of lion anatomy by going to your little house cat. Now let us move on to the name lion. What exactly does this word mean and where does it come from? Now we have sort of imported the word lion from Old French, Lyon, and we did this around the 12th century. But this word comes from Latin and then from Greek. The word leon, which is used in Greek, was of course used to describe the creature we're learning about today, but was also ascribed to the constellation Leo, which is in the sky. The word has been used figuratively in English from about 1200 AD, so this is a very old tradition. It would be used of certain people that had lion-like attributes or qualities, someone that is fiercely brave, but would also be used in a derogatory sense when it came to people or leaders who are specifically tyrannical or greedy. The word lion-hearted can specifically be traced to the year 1708 as its usage. 
We use the term lion's share when we're talking about the greatest portion of something. So you may have a turkey dinner in which the lion's share is allotted to you, meaning that you get most of the turkey or the greatest portion of it. We also use the term the lion's mouth when we're talking about a place of great danger. So it would be used something like that cave is the lion's mouth of this island. So the lion is richly intertwined with our human history in the sense that many people, of course, physically lived near lions, but also in the sense of affecting human art and poetry and metaphor. And the lion is one of the most culturally significant creatures that I can think of. And now let us move on to the review portion of the show. This review is coming all the way from the United States of America, and it was written by Mrs. J. Rooks. And Mrs. J. Rooks writes, I have been listening for a while. I like how this podcast has evolved, but one of the best things that has improved is the introduction. It really helps me get relaxed and like jello, so I can imagine the learning journey. I am intrigued to become a patron so I can access the extinct animals. However, I appreciate the ability to listen for free with no commercials until my financial situation improves. Questions to Seth. Have you done the keybird? I heard it was fearsome, but beautiful. Thank you, Mrs. Rooks, for writing such a wonderful review. I'm so glad that you've been listening for a long time. I am so grateful for your listenership. I'm also grateful that you are enjoying the changes of the podcast. One of the most popular episodes on this podcast is actually the very first one. I believe it's the orangutan. And sometimes when I think of how I recorded that show, what I did, I am honestly a little too embarrassed to go back and listen. I fear that if I go back and listen, I will be motivated to delete it. And so I am going to leave it as it is. In terms of the Patreon, I know how challenging these specific times are in regards to finances, and that is why I have made all of the tiers on Patreon exactly the same, whether you pay $1 a month or whether you pay $10 a month, all of the access is exactly the same, and the difference in price is however much you want to give to the show. Any amount is a result of generosity. And of course, I invite all of you there if you are able. In regards to Seth's question, I have not done the keybird, and I have not even heard that it was fearsome but beautiful because it is the first time I am hearing of such a creature. So I will be sure to give Seth a big shout out when the keybird is done in the future. If you wish to leave a review for the show, it is one of the greatest ways that you can give back if the show has helped you. Thank you all so much for listening to this podcast episode. The facts used in this episode come from WWF.org, NationalGeographic.com, EtimOnline.com, OneKindPlanet.org, and EtimOnline.com. All of the specific links are in the show notes or the description of the episode, and this episode would not have been possible without their contributions. If you wish to request an animal for the show and have your very own episode, you can do so in one of three ways. You can message Relax With Animal Facts on Instagram. You can go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and go to the Animal Request tab. Or you can send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. You can tell me what you like about the show, what you don't like about it, your animal suggestion, and I will be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. I do my best to reply to each and every one of you, but if for some reason I have not responded, it means that you got lost in the pile, and I encourage you to send the same message again or another one if you want, because I want to respond to each and every one of you. On behalf of me personally, I wish everyone listening a very Merry Christmas, and I hope you enjoy plenty of family time and food, this time of year, especially as a Canadian, this time of year is one of my favorites. Of course, it is a little bit more busy, but everyone just seems to be in such a jolly mood. 
And so I hope you all enjoy this festive season and I will see you in the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.